Okay, hey everyone. So, hey, hey Thomas, yeah. So, um, so in this, so actually, we're going to kind of combine the next two um, topics that were on the agenda, um, and, and kind of the reason for that is because they they kind of go together with kind of the end goal of service chaining on overlay networks. Not that you have to tie NSH to Lisp, but but anyways, and, and, and a lot of the background work in implementing these protocols in Open vSwitch was kind of similar. So we thought they, it made sense to kind of combine, you know, the two presentations here. So, so real, real quickly, we'll kind of quickly go over service chaining. I don't want to spend too much time on marketing type stuff, right? But, and then we'll, we'll talk about um, Lisp and, you know, control plane service chaining. Kind of go into detail on network service headers, which is what NSH stands for. Um, I think we talk a little bit about the problem in here. We'll talk about what work we've completed and, you know, what the next steps are and what we hope to accomplish um, after this. So, this is, I think I promised, the only somewhat marketing focused or marketing slide in the presentation, hopefully. hopefully. So, service chaining and network service headers. So, I think most people are familiar with kind of service chaining, right? Service chaining, a broad term that describes delivering multiple services in a specific order, and you know this this becomes even more interesting in the con in the context of uh, NFV, right? Like network function virtualization. So, um, what does service chaining let you do? It you know it lets you decouple the network topology and services. You can support dynamic insertion of services as things are running. Um, there's kind of a common model for all types of services. This is what we're hoping NSH helps to achieve with this. So, um, so NSH is actually kind of com composed of two things, as is typical with these things, right? There's a data playing implementation and, and the control and the policy side of, of service headers as well. Um, so this example, you know, in this example, like I said, we're going to kind of talk about Lisp because uh, Lisp is a, is a an overlay protocol that, that we put into OVS maybe six months ago. Uh, but it's still, there's still more work ongoing with Lisp there as well. Um, so that's kind of a summary of that. So let's see. So I think Vina is going to talk a little bit about the background of Lisp now, too. <laughs> if it works, yeah. OK, so um, uh, I'll talk about, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a very short overview of Lisp. Um, and the, the, the focus is basically um, uh, from the perspective of the control plane that enables service chaining. Um, and then it goes well with the NSH uh, descriptions afterwards. So LISP is a layer 3 over, overlay protocol. Um, it has a control plane uh, that was defined for it. And, and the control plane is decoupled from the data plane and provides uh, network programmability. Um, and uh, one of the main uh, design goals of the control plane was to enable dynamic and on-demand tunneling. Um, so uh, the data plane is um, just an encapsulation header very similar to uh, VXLAN, actually, except for its uh, original design was for L3 in L3. Um, it supports multi-tenancy. Uh, the control plane is very, um, uh, in, in, in the most basic form, it's basically uh, it stores a mapping of the overlay addresses or the virtual space to the underlying physical network. Um, and within that mapping, you can also include some forwarding policy as well. The forwarding policy examples are traffic engineering, service chaining, which is what we um, talked briefly today, um, load balancing, and so on. So um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So this is a, a simple example of how uh, the, for instance, the traffic engineering or service chaining policy um, works in the control plane. So what happens is that um, a network virtualization edge or like a um, virtual switch would um, re uh, receive a packet for a destination that, a virtual destination that it doesn't have a mapping for or a flow for. So what it would do is uh, send a request to this uh, mapping system, which is the basic control plane of ours. Uh, and it will query the mapping, uh, the physical mapping for, um, for that virtual address. And what it will get back is uh, basically the policy for forwarding that um, uh, to the right destination. And for the traffic engineering, we have this uh, format called explicit locator path where we give as 
uh, well, basically the mapping system returns a sequence of uh, encapsulation hops. Um, and uh, that basically defines the path, uh, the traffic engineering path, or uh, it can be service chaining as well. And um, then the NVE basically will uh, figure out where in this path it, it is based on the locator that it has or based on the AP address that it has. And then it will program in the fast path the next, um, the next hop for that, um, for that flow. Uh, so on the on the fast path, basically, only it's, it, it will be a hop to hop um, forwarding. The next. Oh, actually, uh, just one thing on the previous one. So we have a, a few flags there. Um, there is a um, uh, there is a strict uh, S flag for a strict, which uh, which enables us to um, define hops that are not strictly to be enforced. So, for instance, if uh, on the reachability of the data plane, the next hop um, for whatever reason is not reachable or um, if the S bit is not set, you can actually skip that and forward to the next um, next hop that you have reachability to. Um, another thing is the P bit is for reachability protocol that we run on the data plane. Uh, uh, so uh, that just uh, indicates whether the the next hop will accept those or is unable to uh, to respond to those reachability probes. Um, and then there is an L bit, which is a lookup bit, which, uh, for instance, if you have a um, a service or an uh, or an NCAP hop that um, has some sort of mobility uh, capability, uh, then you can basically build this indirection into it where um, when you get the re-NCAP hop, it's actually an indirection and you have to look that up again to find out where the actual location of that hop is. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. Uh, sorry? Oh, so th this is, that's why, like, we're specifying, so regular, usually in the, in the basic version, you would request the virtual address from the mapping, look up the virtual address in the mapping system, and you, what you will get is the physical address that that virtual address uh, is mapped to. So you'll look up a MAC address and you'll get the IP address of the virtual switch. Exactly. So what I'm showing here is not uh, the entire uh, response that you get. I'm just showing here the um, the w version where you get a path instead of just a, a destination. So basically, uh, there up there, if you look, we have the network virtualization edge, which is sending a request for a destination uh, address, uh, um, which we call it uh, endpoint address or uh, endpoint identifier. Uh, which is the let's say a virtual machine's address, and you will look that up in the mapping system, and the mapping system returns to you either one locator, which will be the destination of the the address of the let's say a, um, machine that that VM is located on, or it will return to you a sequence of hops, um, which will basically uh, define that path, uh, the service chaining path, or just the traffic engineering path, and each each locator here, there which is the re cap hop will be basically, so you can have multiple hops. Here we have like two re-encapsulation hops, but you can have like um, as long as a path that you would want. And, uh, and each re cap hop basically has the same kind of Lisp uh, stack. It would, it would get the packet decapsulated, forward it to, um, let's say, a service or, um, or do some sort of processing on it, and then again re-encapsulate to the next hop. So that's how the uh, the path is defined. I understand that. Um, so what is, so hop by hop. It's hop by hop. And it's hop by hop, yeah. This presumes that the management plane understands the topology. So in the control plane, you would define the entire path. So basically, uh, let's say in the mapping system you have an entry for uh, VM uh, with this MAC address or with this IP address, and then there you define the entire path of um, of how to let's say reach to that um, this, um, to that uh, VM. For instance, you would say for this particular prefixes uh, you have to go through a firewall and an NAT or whatever, and so then the uh, each 
let's say, um, agent on the virtualization edge would get the entire path when it, it has a packet matching that uh, destination. And then in the, in the data plane, only it will um, program the next hop for that for itself. Meaning that, um, the, let's say, if we were to implement this, let's say, in OBS, the OBS user space would get this. It will uh, figure out where in the, in the path or in the which reencapsulation hop it is itself. And then it would program a flow with the next NCAP hop for that, um, for that flow. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some sort, uh, this is not, probably not in the case of, let's say, data centers with uh, enclosed uh, environments and so on, but uh, for uh, cases where we have this reach, I mean, LISP has this reachability protocol where you can, uh, on the data plane, figure out if the next hop is actually reachable because it's a, uh, um, and so if the straight pick is not set, meaning that you have like a optional, let's say, service or an optional encapsulation, uh, re-encapsulation hop there, it's better to pass through it, but if it's, it wasn't reachable, we still want to have a, use a different path to the next one. The default is distributed, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so back to the data plane, as I said, it's, uh, we have um, uh, the, the original version of FLIS was um, IP and IP. Uh, there are extensions for, for supporting uh, Mac and IP as well, which would really look very similar to um, VXLAN, uh, except for LISP has a few more flags defined already. Um, and so, uh, uh, actually, let's go to the next slide. So we've, we've worked on this to implement it in OBS. Um, the work complete, completed already uh, includes basic NCAP DCAP support uh, and the flow-based tunneling, and we were very glad to see the flow-based uh, tunneling in OBS because that kind of helped us with um, uh, reaching the goal of uh, doing dynamic on-demand tunneling which, uh, and not creating a port for destination. Um, and so we have support for that uh, in OVS, but not in upstream Linux. Um, the Wireshark uh, dissector for, uh, for Lisp has been there uh, available since 1.10. Uh, and the ongoing, the, 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 actually the, the most uh, problematic thing that we, we faced was that um, OVS was uh, very, I mean it is very uh, L2 uh, oriented. So obviously, and so um, even to define a flow, there we had to have a, um, a Ethernet header. So uh, to enable L3 and L3, uh, which was the basic list, um, we are working on um, enabling more um, layer three generic layer three tunneling, and enabling um, having a flow without an a specifying a flow that does not have an Ethernet header. So uh, basic push and pop Ethernet header was uh, was implemented. And uh, so the work there is ongoing. Also, uh, we needed to look up uh, ARP tables to be able to, um, when we push an Ethernet header, to be able to push the right MAC addresses uh, for the incoming packets based on their um, L3 header. Um, and uh, so we would. So for outgoing packets, we would pop the header, and then it will it will match based on uh, based on the layer three address, the inner layer three address, and it will match a flow, and it, it will be encapsulated and go out. Um, on the incoming, there is no Ethernet header, so we have to push one. That was the that was the encapsulation header. That was the Lisp encapsulation header, which was very similar to. Um, so do you want to go back? Just yeah. Uh, so that's the encapsulation. We have uh, the original packet with an IP header. Then there's a Lisp header, which is this um, uh, enlarged piece, and then another UDP, and then layer three and you know, two. So there's no MAC address in the payload uh, packet. We pop that, and it's L3 in L3. Um, that's the generic Lisp. There is uh, extensions to support. Mac and IP, which would look very similar to um, VXLAN. 
And as you see, the Lisp header actually is very similar to VXLAN. The only difference is um, that a few more flags are defined. And uh, actually, the, the flag number four, which is I, which is instance ID in Lisp, is identical to um, VNI in VXLAN. OK. Uh, so back to here, yeah. So, so that's what uh, is going on right now. Um, Lori Jacob is actually working on uh, on this uh, layer three tunneling support, and hopefully we'll be able to submit the patch sometime in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, we're also looking into enabling Lisp control plane in OBS. Um, haven't started yet. We'll see how that goes. Um, and another effort that is going on is the Lisp GPE. Uh, that stands for um, Generic uh, Protocol Extension. So uh, uh, two drafts were submitted uh, in IETF. I think that uh, we're kind of trying to enable, um, including, um, so a more generic format of including um, IP or, uh, or uh, MAC or NSH headers inside um, the uh, layer three encapsulation. So basically, um, we would be able to put uh, as the inner header of, uh, of Lisp or VXLAN um, any generic protocol based on a protocol type. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, Kyle's going to talk more about that. So with that, I'll hand it to you. Any questions on the Lisp slide? No. OK. Thanks. OK. So let's see. I think we're doing, I think we're doing good on time here. So, um, so I just. Wanted to t so this slide kind of touches on, you know, the service chaining data plane components and, and and kind of how they they relate to NSH, which which was what we're going to talk about now. So you can kind of see we've got four different um, four different components here: a traffic classifier, a service path, um, service overlay, and a context here. Um, it, it's I think it's it's pretty straight forward you know look if you take a look at this as to what they what they do um, so let me pop over to so this is kind of this is and again this this NSH is also an IETF draft as well and so this is this is kind of like what the basic uh, the basic header is composed of um, <clears throat> it's got the the base header and then these these context headers um, as well I think one of the I mean, one of the key things that, that we had mentioned before was, you know, the, the NSA header is really transport agnostic, so you can kind of stack it on whatever, whatever overlay protocol you want, VXLAN, LISP, NVGRE, MPLS. Um, I have some backup slides that kind of show that at the end, but, but it's pretty, pretty safe as well. Um, and then the other key point here is that the, the context her headers are going to carry the metadata along with the service path. Um, and, and that all of that is likely populated by the control plane because it's the one that's that's programming these service paths as well um, I have another slide that this one kind of goes into um, a little bit more detail on on the NSA header as well as to what's in there um, so as you can see um, Let's see, we, we effectively have two bits that are of significance at the front there, the O and the C bit as well. Um, the O bit is the OEM bit. It's going to indicate if the packet should be punted um, or not. And the C bit indicates if context headers are, are there. In it. Um, and then we have the, the, the protocol type of the packet as well. The service index, um, so that's, that's what's actually used as it says, with the service path identifier to derive um, unique value, basically where we're going to send the packet as well. Um, and then the service path identifier is, is the identity of, of whatever your service is, whether that's physical or virtual or whatever it is, but that's the identifier of where you're going to send it as well. Um, and then the context headers are effectively um, metadata that, that the control plane can program that the services you know, will know about when it gets it there. So kind of tying this together a little bit at least um, we, we put this slide up and, and like I said I mean NSH is really protocol agnostic but I mean since we're talking about Lisp as well we thought we'd throw up um, NSH plus Lisp um, you know and as actually we 
that there's a mild problem with this that, and it, this, is it, this problem is actually addressed as Vina indicated by um, the IETF draft around uh, generic protocol encapsulation as well here, so. Um, but effectively, you know, LISP has no mechanism to signal the presence of a non-IP payload yet, but um, GPE should help to solve that as well. Um, so let's see. Uh, getting to the interesting stuff here. So there's some more, um, uh, you know, transport agnostic. Um, let's see, I think we talked about all of this. So um, actually, hold on. We're, I want to skip. Um, I'm going to skip that slide just a sec here. Okay, yeah, let's get to the interesting stuff here. Uh, oh, did we already, we talked about LISP, right? Okay, NSH work. So the NSH work that, that we've been doing, we, we started working on that this summer. Um, and um, so we, we started working on that in OVS, and we started implementing NSH initially uh, on top of VXLAN uh, in OVS, kind of as a proof of concept to, to try it out. And um, it, it turns out it was maybe not the best time to do it, as Jesse knows, with all the, with all the changes in OVS around upstreaming, you know, combining the, the tunneling code, right, collapsing it with the upstream tunneling code. Uh, we actually spent, we spent a lot of time rebasing and reworking that. And, and, and likely, we, one of the things that, that we have to do is, is on the bottom there, you know, we want to move the end cap, decap, the NSH stuff into the, the kernel rather than tying it into OVS. But, it allowed us to, to kind of prototype this at least initially like that. So we, we did finish that. We tied that to the VXLAN code as well. Um, uh, one, of, one of the people working on it wrote a wire circ, uh, dissector as well. Um, one of the interesting things that we did as far as, you know, how do you program the NSH fields, right? How do you let a control plane do it? Well, the way that we did it was we decided that um, we were going to use the OpenFlow support in OVS for this as well. So. So we added support for that, um, for flow matching on the service path ID as well. Um, and then we added support to OVS, VS Kettle, and, and OF Kettle for the above flow matching uh, points as well. Um, one of the, we, and I, I talked to, um, I had talked to the, you know, Ben about this as well. How do we want to do this? And I mean, the, the, real, the, the real way to do this would be to work with like the ONF if we wanted to add new OpenFlow uh, extensions to do this. So I think after talking to Ben, what we, at least what him and I had talked about was we might add some, some extensions into OVS to allow programming this. Because then what that allows is that allows your, your controller to essentially utilize the OpenFlow control pro protocol to, to program the NSH stuff as well. So, um, so the, the next steps are I, I the code, we were we were going to push the code last uh, last week, but um, in testing it, we we hit you know after the latest rebase, we hit a bunch more problems. I it may actually have been pushed this morning. I'm not sure, but we're hoping to get it out if not this morning, soon uh, as well, and then start iterating over it. Um, mostly, we're looking for OVS people to review it and have a look and provide feedback. So, um, uh, you know. One of the things, so let's see, the other thing we're looking at doing is add support for this NSH service index to be allowed to be set using, using this parameter as well, so we can set that as a flow parameter as well. Um, and I th think we, Fina touched on the Lisp stuff as well as far as uh, the next steps for upstreaming that. Um, but, uh, but Lisp is similar. So Lisp is, I, I, so Jesse, I think Lisp is the only protocol in OVS that's not upstream right now, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's the... Yeah, yeah, that's, and, and, you know, and Lori's been working on that, but it's, it's a bigger thing because of the, some of the L3 specific stuff. But so, so we're working on that, but, uh, but the hope is to get Lisp upstream into the Linux kernel as well. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's, that's the work we have going on there. So, so I mean, if we, if we look at what, what is kind of the end goal of, of all this, all this stuff, well, you know, maybe... The end goal is to allow kind of an elastic overlay-based service network using NSH for services to be able to steer traffic to service VMs or even hardware that, that supports NSH. Um, utilize whatever overlay network you want for that. Um, GPE, hopefully that will unify LISP and VXLAN as well. You know, and then, well, how are you going to program all this, right? Well, then the logical thing is why not utilize something like Open Daylight to, to actually program um, the NSH stuff as well. 
Um, so the, and then you know, and then you can tie Open Daylight into your Elastic Cloud platform of, of choice as well. So, so that that's the uh, thinking there. Um, what made us use? I guess we, we could have gone either either route, right? Because um, we, we could have done it using OBSDB as well. Um, but I think the thought was that perhaps eventually we, we may want to try to, I mean, if, the, if, if NSH becomes useful and the community takes it up, it may be something we, we want to push into the, the ONF as well. So, so if we start out with this as an extension to OpenFlow that way, then it's, it's easier that way. Well, it, I, I think it, it, it could be, and it seems like adding it as an extension initially is, is a nice way to see if, if it takes, if people like it, or what support it gets. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, yeah, and that's, that's, definitely a, that's definitely a valid concern. I think it, it, it probably depends on, on your use case, I guess, and how much you're willing to tolerate on on how much extra headers. I, um, I, that's a good question, actually. I mean, uh, that's something I'd have to get back to you on, honestly. I, I, yeah. You're in, yeah, you're in, okay. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends, right? I mean, I mean, you saw tons of context editors for NSH, right? So it kind of depends on what additional metadata you want and what, what serv you know, what the, the services need for that. So it's, it's kind of variable. Not that variable-sized headers are, you know, very good, right? But. So, so ILNP is tries to solve a similar problem as Lisp, I believe, right? It's, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's I think it's, it, yeah, I think that's the best way to describe it. It's trying to solve a similar problem as what Lisp is. It, was there an ILMP presentation? That, oh, okay. Because I thought there was, early on, I saw one. I know it would have been, yeah, it would have been interesting, but okay. So, um, let's see, I think I only have one more. Well, I think that's about it, yeah. Just a question slide, so. Yeah, so any, any questions or? Well, okay, I'm going to answer quick, and then I'll let Vina either expand or tell me I'm wrong with what I'm saying. But, but originally, I mean, one of the main, one of the big problems that LIST was designed to solve was um, IP mobility, right, by separating kind of the, the endpoint, right, from, from how you get to the endpoint, right? So, so, like, for example, an area where LISP is, is used currently is, is for mobile phones with IP addresses as you're roaming across networks or between Wi-Fi and and cellular and things like that. So, so and, and again, it utilizes the the whole mapping system, the control plane, and all that for that solution. So, so I can't, it was it was kind of designed to solve, I think, a slightly different problem. But but maybe. Right. So it was designed initially to solve uh, the overloading of the um, routing tables in the core. So that was it came from a whole different uh, different problem, and the, the, this um, uh, dual well, semantics of IP address where it uh, both defines the endpoint and the, the location or routing um, uh, address of that endpoint was, was a problem that was uh, noticed as, that is leading to um, um, uh, enlarged um, routing tables in the core. And so the, the idea was that uh, there, there were different protocols, including ILMP, that were proposed to separate this uh, identity of the endpoint from uh, the location or the routing address, and that way the connections or the, the layer three, let's say TCP uh, and layer three protocols will con the, uh, will uh, the host the TCP sessions will connect to 
the endpoint address, um, which was decoupled from the routing address. And then there will be an encapsulation or something like ILMP, which is uh, kind of playing with two, uh, dividing the, IP, the IPv6 address into two, um, two sections. And, uh, and then you could actually um, aggregate, make the, make the outer layer or the physical routing addresses more aggregated uh, versus the endpoints could, could, could move along um, and still don't um, clutter the routing tables in the core. So that was the initial problem and, and, and that was, uh, and LIST was proposed for that and because of the mapping address, the mapping system that it has, it could do dynamic um, uh, kind of tunneling based on where you go. So it addresses mobility but, um, but it was originally, that, that's, the, that's the purpose of original. And, and it, but as you see, it fits very well in the in the network virtualization concepts because of that separation. So the, the the ID will become the virtual address, and the and the location or routing address will become the physical address. And it also supports multi-tenancy, um, similar to VXLandas, and so that's where we see it fit. Okay. Thank you.